Just by the way, for those grown-ups who are upset by the story and realise that they too might get tricked now and again, uh, I think it's true to say that uh, granddads and grandmas, for that matter, have got a pretty fair idea what's going on. And I think Grandpa played into the game very nicely there. And I'm sure that, uh, that he knew what the trick was, but he just played the game with us. So don't feel too sorry for Grandpa. He was enjoying the joke every much, uh, a bit as much as, uh, as we kids were. <clears throat> Today I want to talk about some aspects of a thing called the church. The church means different things to different people. To you here today, perhaps the church, because it is the Sabbath day and we are in a building that is called the church, is, uh, is a group of people having a particular kind of a service, a particular kind of get-together. For some, of course, the church will mean a denomination, may be called the Church of England or Roman Catholic or Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist. For others, the church can mean the building, probably with a steep roof and a steeple. For others, it might mean a cathedral. Some of you will have seen some of those magnificent cathedrals in Europe and in Britain, built unfortunately for the wrong reasons, but nonetheless many people went there to worship and hear God's word read and spoken. Do you know that most of the huge cathedrals in Europe were built under competition? And people who owned large territories or governed large territories in Europe or in Britain had this kind of a competition going which lasted for some hundreds of years to build a taller building than their neighbour over there and to build a more magnificent building with better architecture and most of all with a spire that went higher than the one over the hill or across the water in a different country. It was competitive and so they taxed the people very substantially in order to build their cathedrals. Sometimes, of course, the thought went on to the next generation and the next, and the cathedrals took a long time to build. One of the objects was to get a spire that went higher and higher because that was thought to get closer to the mind of God. Closer to God. So the higher your spire could be, the more religious, supposedly, were the people who contributed, under taxation of course, which they didn't like, but they contributed to the building of the cathedral. The church has had different <coughs> interpretations down through the ages. I'd like to go to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 16, and uh, just see what Jesus had to say about the church. <coughs> Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And Jesus is talking with Simon Peter. And Peter often had questions and he often had uh, uh, a little bit of a, a block, if you like, in understanding of things. Jesus is talking to Peter. But Jesus is really saying something very nice to Peter here. And uh, it is really a compliment to Peter. You see, Jesus had asked the disciples to define just who he was. For the people had different ideas about Jesus. Some of them said he was John the Baptist who had come back to life for them. Again, some of them said he was uh, Elijah who had come back, an ancient prophet in the Old Testament times. They had different ideas about Jesus. And Jesus asked the disciples... His 12 uh, um, special followers, what do you say about me? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter uh, had an answer and he said, you are the Christ. The Christ is a word which means Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. You are the Messiah, the saviour 
of the world. You are the son of the living God. You are a divine being. Peter says, you are the divine being who's come down from heaven. You are the one, he is saying, who was promised by God and the Old Testament prophets had verified that uh, this would happen. They had portrayed it, foreseen it. You are that one, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed or uh, happy you are, Peter. Um, you, you have been privileged, Peter, or Simon Barjona, which was really his uh, surname. You have been greatly blessed for flesh and blood. This is, has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus is saying to Peter, it's no ordinary thing that you've come to understand this. This is something that God has revealed to you. God has put this into your mind so that you start to understand what I'm all about. So you've been greatly privileged. <clears throat> and then Jesus says, I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or of death, for hell here is really the same as death, the gates of hell and the grave will not prevail against it. And so God is, Jesus is really complimenting Peter on his understanding of who Jesus is. But he says, upon this understanding, I will build my church. As sure as you are Peter, Jesus says, as sure as you know that you are Peter, uh, I can assure you that because of the understanding you have, about me being the Son of God and me being the Messiah will be the basis upon which I will build my church. Now, when this is translated from the Greek language, it doesn't translate all that easily. And we can often think that Jesus is saying to Peter, you are a great rock and I'm going to build my church upon you. But uh, that's not the true understanding of this. Jesus is saying, as sure as you are Peter uh, <coughs> and... Uh, it is certain that upon this rock, upon this certainty, upon this confidence, the confidence that Peter had shown that Jesus was the Son of God is what the church is going to be built upon. That's what he is talking about. I'll build my church upon this confidence and the gates of hell and death, the, the, all the opposition that can be brought and the greatest, of course, opposition that could be brought against anybody is death. The greatest opposition will not prevail, will not succeed in destroying that basis for my church. So Jesus is not talking about a building. If he was talking about a building, he would have pointed to Jerusalem and he would have pointed to the temple in Jerusalem and he would have said, look at those huge foundation stones that are set there and they are immovable. They were cut out in Solomon's mines, uh, and they have been there for uh, uh, 1,100, 1,000 years, and uh, they are so solid and firm that every time the temple is destroyed and rebuilt, it'll be built again on those huge slabs of stone. Jesus was not talking about that. He was talking about something else. Jesus was talking about church in a different way. Jesus was talking about church as something that is hard, in a sense, to put your finger on. How can you put your finger on a thing like belief and understanding? I can't take a handful of belief and put it into a bucket and say, here you are, have a bucket full of belief. It doesn't work that way, does it? Belief is something that is in your mind. Belief is what comes to your mind after you've put together a whole lot of information. And when you've put this information together, you have something called belief that's in your mind. And you are certain that this information tells you something that you can have confidence in. Or it may tell you something that you do not have confidence in as well. But... Uh, <coughs> As far as Jesus and the church was concerned, he was talking about something that you can't just pick up and carry away like a building. 
Someone showed me a building last week and they said, you know where this building came from? I said, no, no idea. And they said it came from somewhere down the line, was it Wellsford or Kaiwaka, somewhere down the line there. And uh, they'd taken it to bits and they'd shifted it up to Tikipunga. The Trinity Church at Tikipunga is uh, that building. Uh, Waipu, was it? Yeah, they'd shifted it and uh, in the old days and uh, they'd uh, shifted it up there in pieces and reconstructed it and it's had a few changes since. The church is not something that you can pick up and shift around. Church really is something that is made up of belief. It is made up of a confident belief in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the one who saves human beings from eternal destruction. That's what church is all about. When we say we come to church, we're sort of thinking in two things. One, we're coming to a building, and two, we're coming to a meeting. But the church is not just that. You see, the Greek word for church, and the word church only comes into the New Testament, and it's only found in Greek. We don't find that word church in the Old Testament. Although the Bible tells us that there was a church back there in those old days, all right? There was a church there in the wilderness, the apostle tells us, and that church in the wilderness was the children of Israel moving from Egypt to the land of Palestine. They were called a church. They weren't a church just because there was a couple of million people uh, going along there. That's not why they were called a church. They were called a church because they had a belief in a God, a belief that the nations around about them did not hold. They had a belief and understanding of God the God who created them, the God who created the world, the God who created the universe, they had a belief and confidence that that God was a good God who would care for them and who would take them from the land of Egypt to the land of Palestine where they should have been all the time and would care for them as a nation. Their churchiness was in their belief and understanding. It wasn't in the fact that they were just a group of people. So when we come over into the times of Jesus and later, uh, we find that the church is, uh, uh, is uh, in the Greek ecclesia, and the term ecclesia really is used to describe the church, but the term ecclesia is also used in many other ways in those days and probably still is today in the Greek language. If any of you know anything about the Greek language, you'll know that ecclesia is the gathering together of a group of people, the getting together of a group of people. But not just a group of people who come to see what happened when a car smashed into the light post down here, as it did a few weeks ago or a few, a few months ago now. Um, that's not an ecclesia. A group of people form ecclesia when they're a group of people together with the one mind. That makes them ecclesia, when they come together with the one thought, uh, common thinking for the common purpose, to think around common themes, to review common uh, events. And so the church, the ecclesia of the New Testament, is not just a group of people, is not just any group of people who are curious and come together to see what Jesus is talking about. They are not an ecclesia. The ecclesia is a group of people who have a common thought. You see, an ecclesia could be a group of people who make up the local council, for instance. They come together for the common purpose of working together as a council. And so the church, the ecclesia of the New Testament, is a group of people who are bound together in mind. Bound together in mind. Remember that. It's a very important thing to remember. They're bound together in a philosophy bound together in a system of thought which will direct the way that they believe they should act, the way they should think, and the way that they should uh, relate to other people. There is a philosophy involved. <clears throat> Back in the, in the book of Ephesians, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and then the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I seem to have a lot of Corinthians here, but Ephesians. 
Galatians and uh, Ephesians chapter 5. And I want verse 23 out of that chapter. And uh, it says, For the husband is head of the wife, and he's talking about husbands and wives and using it as a picture of the church. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Wherefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their husbands in everything, and so he goes on. And he's using the idea of marriage here to portray a picture of the church. And he's using a picture of the church to convey the picture of what a good marriage should be like. So he's using uh, the thing in two different ways. But he says, we can put these two together. You see, in a good marriage, there is a unity of mind. A marriage is not a marriage unless two minds are merged in many different ways. There has to be a commonality of thinking in many areas, otherwise a marriage is not really a marriage. And there has to be a commonality in thinking between people and Jesus Christ, otherwise you do not have an ecclesia, you do not have a church. Which makes me think to myself, how can we have the concept of a church and at the same time have such independence of thinking in our own mind about spiritual things and still call ourselves part of the church. There has to be a coming together of the minds of the people on a common basis in order to be able to say, these people are a church. And that common denominator, we are told, is Jesus Christ. Even as Christ is head of the church and is the saviour of the body, the body of the church, the body of people, Jesus Christ is the common denominator to make up a church. And so if we want to claim to be part of the church, we need to get our thinking in line with the thinking of Jesus Christ. If our thinking is contrary to the thinking of Christ, we have no right to claim to belong to the church. There's groups of people all over the world who call themselves church. There's the Moonies. You've heard about the Moonies because you see they're, right up, uh, they're written up about in the newspapers from time to time because they have done some peculiar things and uh, people feel they've been brainwashed by them or whatever. Well, I don't want to go into all their beliefs and whatever, but uh, they call themselves a church. But when you look into their understanding and philosophy of life, you soon discover that it's miles away from the philosophy of Jesus Christ. So they have no justification, really, to call themselves a church. They can only call themselves a church in the understanding of the general public's understanding of church, a group of people who are religious. That's not really what makes a church. There are people who <coughs> belong to uh, other groups, and I could name a whole lot of them, in fact, who do things and teach things and, uh, and, uh, and become uh, quite the opposite to Jesus Christ. They teach quite the opposite to what Jesus has taught. Their philosophy of life and their philosophy of of, uh, of truth is so foreign to Jesus Christ that the apostles have declared some of these groups in his day as the apostle Paul would do today if he were still alive declare them to be heretics to be dangerous, to be injurious to be um, distanced from uh, the, uh, the people of God and uh, a lot of other terminology is used and uh, in some places it's even called anathema, which is so removed from God that they are under condemnation. And yet they call themselves a church. I want you to be clear today that if you are part of the church, the part of the church that Jesus and the disciples were talking about 
You are one whose mind is in tune with Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. Jesus said, upon the confidence, upon this confidence that you have, this faith that you have, that I am the saviour of the world, is what the church is built on. Down through the ages, there's been an organisation that the scripture calls the church and history calls the church that can rightly and justly claim to be the biblical church. The organisation was not always headed by a priest or by a king or by a archbishop or by some visible visible leader or entity, it was often only that which was in the minds of a group of people, either large or small, that constituted them to be justly called the church. And it started with Adam. The longest living organisation that has uh, operated in the world is the church. Coca-Cola celebrated a while ago that they had been around for 100 years, was it? 100 years of Coca-Cola. And uh, someone gave me three banana boxes of Coca-Cola cans with the uh, uh, centenary celebration logo picture, whatever it is. They drank the contents, fortunately or unfortunately. I didn't want the contents, but I was interested in the cans. And they're sitting in my carport at the moment. And if any of you want some of them, you're welcome to have them because I don't think it's a fantastic thing to celebrate, but they thought that they had been around a long time. There are religious denominations that celebrate the fact that they've been around for nigh on 2,000 years, and they think that that's great. There's political organisations and, uh, and other uh, similar groups that say they've been around since the year dot, but none of them can claim to have been around as long as the church. Adam was the founder, founding member, I should say, of the church. And although Adam made his mistake, Adam was in tune with the mind of God. He made his mistake. And in a way, his mistake led him into tune with the mind of God, perhaps uh, more... um, significantly, should I say, than if he had never sinned. It would be great if he had never sinned. It would be great if we could stand here today and say, we've never sinned, we've never inherited a problem of uh, selfishness and, and uh, opposition to God, but uh, that's not the way it is. But Adam discovered something about God, something about God that he may never have understood so well after he sinned. Millions of angels discovered something about God after Adam sinned that they had never understood so well. And that is that God is a forgiving God. God is a forgiving God and Jesus Christ, that part of the Godhead who represents God to us human beings, he is a forgiving saviour. And that the Holy Spirit, who is the third part of that Godhead, who is the, 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 the working uh, influence within us that uh, adjusts our mind and our thinking, that prompts us to think about spiritual things and to think about justice and fairness and morality and honesty and all that sort of thing, the Holy Spirit, it was discovered, was also a forgiving spirit. And so the whole Godhood, that fellowship of those three beings, was discovered by Adam to be a forgiving Godhood. Not wanting to condemn and to destroy those who opposed him, for God had said that it's a strange work that he does that he ever destroys anything, but that God is a God who forgives. For as soon as Adam and Eve had admitted their guilt, God said to them, I will provide a saviour. They didn't know the saviour by the name of Jesus Christ at that time, 
For the name Jesus Christ didn't come to be attached to the Saviour until after Jesus was born in this world about 2,000 years ago. And then he became known as Jesus Christ because the people spoke a different language. But in the Old Testament, he was known as the Lord and as the Saviour and, and, and by many other names. And those people were blessed with the knowledge that God forgives sins. And people were to have confidence in the fact that God forgives sinful human beings and he does not hold their sins against them provided they will allow him to control their lives. And then the sinfulness that is part of the human nature starts to take a lower place because the sinlessness of Jesus Christ, that authentic human being who came to the world, dominates the mind and the thinking of the human being who will allow the other part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to come into their life. For Jesus says, I am the one who authorizes the Holy Spirit to come into the life of a sinful being and change that being who would normally be self-centered and who would normally want everything their own way, who would normally not acknowledge me, I will change the thinking of that person so that they will see the beauty of the quality of character that I have and that they will too desire to be a harmless person, a person who wants to live like the original human being, Adam, lived before he sinned, with no tendency towards sinfulness and evil, no desire to do that which was wicked, no desire to oppose God. But remember that he did fall under the temptation of the devil, who for some reason had set himself up in opposition to God and determined to take the human race with him. You see, the church was started back there with Adam. And if you go down through the years, you can sort of characterize the different eras by certain people who seem to be the leaders in representing the church. And you can go down to Noah, you can go down to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. Um, you can go down to Samuel the prophet. You can go down to Elisha and Elijah, those great prophets who represented God in a very evil age. You can go down to Daniel and uh, his companions who stood for God and for what was right and what was moral and what was decent and, and what was uh, godly in that time. And you can come down to the New Testament and you even find mention there were some people in the temple in Jerusalem who were faithful to God. There was the old lady Anna, about 80 years old, faithful to God, who represents the church there. And there was Zechariah who represented the church there. Why did they represent the church rather than the high priest? the high priest with all his regalia and all his stuff on and with his pride and his pomp, why is he not mentioned in the Bible as representing the church? Because his mind was not in tune with God. His mind was not in tune with Jesus Christ, the Saviour. But the others were. And they are mentioned as people who were significant representatives of the church. You come on a little bit and you have the apostles. And later you have the church fathers. And later the, uh, uh, than that you have the reformers, the Martin Luthers and the John Calvins and, and others. And as you come down through time, you find that their eras are represented by different people. Not that those people stand for everybody else, but the era is represented by the dedication of certain people with their determination to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to be connected with him. And so when Jesus says he builds his church upon the fact 
that there are people who are confident that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the human race. <clears throat> when uh, we recognize that Jesus is also our personal Savior, <clears throat> 